um, some of the populations we have challenge the idea of what a population is. We have two species of manzanita that are down to a single individual. This is that a population. We have others that have been down to single digits. Many that are fewer than 100. So we really have some very, very small populations. And there's some particular issues. So if they're this small, I mean, I think it's a legitimate question, should we put our effort here? And I'd like to spend at least a couple of minutes explaining my thought process of why we should do that. So yes, historically, some of these have always been small. So it's not just that they were small through some action that was associated with humans, but they've always been small populations. And they may not provide much in the way of ecosystem services when we talk about looking at things that are changing major aspects of the environment. And they may never have been really broadly abundant or widely distributed. So the two plants I have here are the Pinkin Marsh Lily and the Kenwood Marsh Checker Blue, never widely distributed, out on the coast, in you know, the snow Napa area. And there's not a lot of them, never work. Just how it was. So I think the first thing is, you know, for these kind of species, what should the goal be? Should it be recovery? And in terms of the fish and wildlife service, recovery means getting to the point where there's threats so it's no longer in danger of extinction or being threatened with extinction. I think some of these species historically had such small populations that they would always be at risk of extinction. So maybe we need to think about a different goal. Maybe we should be talking about achieving population stability reversing declines and allowing for persistence into the future. That might be something that's more reasonable for some of these extremely small populations. As an example, the Tiburon Mariposa lily, one site, Ring Mountain in Ring County. That's just where it is. And at this point, we've gotten to the point where that's all there is. It's threatened with extinction as a small population, but it's not going to get much better than we already have. It's being managed. This is all we know it ever was. So let's keep doing what we're doing. It may never be delisted. So, there are some challenges here. We're talking about long-term management. It's going to go on forever. On the other hand, when we're only talking about a few individuals or a few sites, you can get a lot done with a little bit of money. So I think one of the answers to why should we focus on conserving these very, very small populations is that we can actually do it with some of the resources that we have. And in addition to that, it's just the right thing to do. All right, so we've decided that we're going to try to do this. We're going to try to save these populations. So. We have 103 that we're the lead for from the South Carolina field office. How do we decide where to start? Well, we have some guidance from some of our own policy. We have something called a recovery priority number. And these are guidelines that help us kind of figure out how should we allocate our resources. And it's not meant to be an inflexible framework. There's a lot of ability to move around, but it's a starting point. We have a numerical ranking that gives us a sense of, is this a really high priority? Is this a low priority? And part of that ranking is based on recovery potential, but considering things like what are the limiting factors? Do we know what's going on? What are the threats? Do we understand how the threats operate? And what is the level of management that's going to be needed if we're actually going to keep this thing around for the long term? We also consider conflict with development or other construction activities. So in California, one of the big issues is that you have a lot of these really sort of nutrient poor servitude habitats. And here are two species that are in direct conflict with development that are on serpentine habitats. So highways going through, other development, loss of habitat, nitrogen deposition from the automobiles going by, and they're threatened by that. And so you have that species would have a particular number, then you'd have a little C to it or conflict. And that would be ranked above a similar species in terms of priority that didn't have any sort of conflict with it. All right, so this is what we have. We have a ranking scale from highest priority one down to 18, incorporating threat level, recovery potential, and taxonomy. So we get to some of the issues that we've heard about this morning about what is the taxonomic value? Should we be thinking about this? And you can see that a monotypic genus ranks a lot higher than a subspecies. And that is sort of a logical way to approach this. So you have San Francisco garter snake. We determine that it has a high threat level. We think it's likely to be recovered to subspecies. So it ends up with a numeric value of three. There's also conflict with development so it ends up with a 3C. Similarly, you can walk through for the white ear Penikita, end up at an 8. Or the Tiburon Maripostal, which we talked about before. The threat levels are low. The recovery potential is low, as we just discussed before. It's a species, so it's a 17. So it's like, well, it's not really something we need to worry about right now. It shouldn't be our highest priority. So that's the starting point. That's where we start our prioritization scheme. There's other things that we think about. We think about the opportunity that we have right now and the urgency that we have right now. I think Perhaps the most classic example is the Franciscan manzanita that you see getting loaded onto that truck right there. So some of you may know this story already. They were doing the 
improvement in safety stuff for the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge approach from Doyle Drive. Some guy was driving along and he said, oh, there's a manzanita. It shouldn't be here. It was actually a species that had been thought to go extinct, I think, in the 30s, and it was the last one that's left. It was extinct, so of course it's not listed. It's a, but this is a billion dollar project that is going to be going through the last little remnant. It's going to get wiped out. This is a very urgent issue. So we don't necessarily need to limit ourselves when we think about conservation to species that are limit, that are listed, or just things that have a high recovery priority number. So we actually worked with a lot of different partners, and that's the second point here, is that you need to have people who are willing to work with you, especially when you're looking at an agency that has limited funding resources and staff resources. And the types of partners that we work with, you don't have to think about as just pro-environmental groups. It can be a variety of different types of folks. In this case, Caltrans was very supportive of actually working with us on this because they wanted to look at through their project. They didn't want to actually push a species to extinction. That's not something that they want. So we had this huge project where we actually loaded the whole plant plus, I don't know, something like 17 tons of dirt that was this root ball onto a truck, moved it across from my secret location of the serpentine soils, and planted it. And it's doing okay right now. So opportunity, urgency, and partners. Same story with the Lang's metal mark butterfly. It is declining right now. It's urgent. We're down to, I think, a peak count of 30-some this last year. This is something that we're actively working on because it's so urgent. The recovery priority number may not be the highest, but it's something that we need to look at right now. Otherwise, we're not going to have a chance in the future. All right, some of the challenges, of course, limited funding, especially when you're looking at a field office level. We're not talking about national priorities here. This is the field office. We don't always have a lot of money. So we have to figure out how to be most efficient. The other thing is, you know, in terms of science, and many of you are coming at this from a research perspective, we don't necessarily know everything we would like to know. There's always, you can say, well, you should know about the population genetics. You should know about how this ecological factor works. But if the Manzanita is about to get plowed over, you don't have time to find out. So we have to act sometimes with the best available science, and sometimes that is just an expert's opinion. Also, we occasionally run into issues with public support. When the vertical cool ferry ship was being listed, that was a huge issue, and it still can be. There's a lot of you know, the pushback of, why do we have to deal with this sea monkey? And that's just kind of part of what goes on out there. All right, so we've talked about some of the challenges, some of the things that we think about prioritization. So do we have any examples that provide us a path of how to do this? And I want to talk about two specific species where we've had a lot of success. The first one is Baker's Larkspur. And actually, the two primary people driving the recovery of the species are the audience today, Kate Simons and Holly Forbes are both here. And this is an incredible story when you actually stop and think about this. This species was historically known for maybe three populations in Marin Sonoma County. By the time it was listed, it was down to a single population along the roadside where we have that circle there. Early 2000s, a county road crew had to deal with some flooding issues. They scraped away half the population off the side of the road, so half of it's gone. After that, there was a controlled burn in the area. The burn crew went and set a backfire on top of the last part of the population. We had, I think it was something like five individuals that persisted under a log. That's it. That's all that's left in the log. All right, so here, Kevin is your example of something where we have somebody working on the species. So Holly is with UC Berkeley Botanical Garden, and it's actually been doing a lot of work for us. And we started off with site monitoring, but also seed collection and propagation at UC Berkeley. And at the, we got it to the point where we had 250 in propagation. We had to let them assure so they were actually being ready to be reintroduced into the wild. And we came up with a reintroduction plan. The species doesn't have a recovery plan. And as somebody who asked a question earlier was suggesting, it's a very long time to get to a recovery plan. That doesn't mean we can't come up with a peer-reviewed document that tells us what's the best thing to do. We can still do conservation, good conservation, while we're waiting to finish a recovery plan. All right, so we're ready to reintroduce them. So what do we do next? We have to find a place to put them. Well, the challenge then is we don't have any national parks or anything out in that particular area which provides the right habitat. It's all on private land. And frequently, you may have heard, private landowners get a little edgy about having endangered species on their property. And that's understandable. So how do you, what do you do? How do you get out there? So people like Kate Simons, who's with our partners program, go out and actually meet landowners and try to build that bridge so you can actually understand what they need, what your needs are, and develop a relationship. Because it comes very much down to the relationship you have with that individual and you have to develop a level of trust. So we developed these relationships, cooperative agreements. 
that describes what the elements are, what the responsibilities are, how the funding is, when do we have access to your property, when do we not have access, how long does it last, and how you can terminate it. So these agreements can be terminated. So we're putting plans out there that we care very much about. We don't want to be going out and having an agreement that can be terminated with somebody who's not really dedicated to conservation and just thinks it's kind of a neat little thing to do. So this really does involve a lot of trust on both sides. The landowner has to trust that not, we're not trying to make anything sneaky. And we have to trust that they're actually going to be in it for the long term and willing to work with us to promote conservation. All right, then you get to the good news here. After all of their work, we have three new introduction sites within three miles of the original site. So, you know, it doesn't sound like a whole lot. You're up to four sites. But considering where we work, five plants, this is a huge success. And I think this is one of the paths that we can look at. And the amount of resource we're talking about here when compared to some of the general money spent on a dangerous species recovery is really relatively small. We're talking about hundreds of thousands rather than tens of millions. And we're on a path to recovery. The next example I want to talk about is the Shasta crayfish. And the Shasta crayfish, we have recovered prior number of five, so it's moderately high. And in this case, we're looking at conservation sort of after all of the regulatory conflict and dust has settled. We had a lot of issues early on in terms of the Section 7 consultation process with pg and and their power plants and dams. And these people who were initially in sort of a negotiation process with Friends of the Conservation are now some of the passionate and dedicated partners that are on the team that is led by Maria Ellis. And so we really have a good team here. And that's one of the things that I don't think I can emphasize enough, is that you need to have somebody who is an expert on the ground and willing to really commit themselves to conservation of the species. We don't have enough people in our office to cover 103 species and be effective. We need to rely on these partners. So Shasta crayfish has a tiny little range. You know, as we know, limited distribution is an extinction threat. And the main issue is invasives. And this is sort of the classic story. We have this nice habitat. We have these invasive signal crayfish. The signal crayfish is just a better crayfish than a crayfish. You know, it <laughs> matures faster. It has more young. It has a wider tolerance for different ecological kinds of conditions. And as you can see from this graph, the proportion of native Shasta crayfish has been declining precipitously, and we're losing them. That's it. You know, so we have a lot of different things that we're trying to get done. And we're able to because we have this great team. One of the first things that we're doing is a variety of different types of research. Of course, we have surveys, but we're also able to fund genetic work through the Section 6 process that was actually done here in the General Variation Lab at Davis, and identify different populations. Each one of the different colors on there represents a genetic group. And we, so that tells us how we should sample and where we should do reintroductions if we get to the point of reintroduction or if we ever want to capture propagation. We have some basic information, so we actually are in a situation here that's a lot better than many species where we know a little bit about what's going on. So moving from there, we know that we need to find new places to put them. We need to get them to a place where they're safe from the invasives. The invasives are spreading through these systems. So the next step is we want to do a safe harbor agreement. Safe harbor agreements are situations where we talk to a landowner and say, well, you, you enhance your landscape for the benefit of an endangered species and it increases, we won't hold you responsible for that increase if you change your mind later and want to bring it back down to what it was before. And so we're getting conservation benefit, and in the meantime, that person is doing things that they're not on the hook for in the long term. So that's really great. So one of the things that, in this particular case, was interesting was another matter of developing a relationship where you can trust each other. The landowner, in this case, has zero crayfish. So we're setting a baseline of zero. So they could actually go back down to nothing. They could wipe out a whole new population that we're going to establish. But we think it's worth it anyway because the population that we're going to be taking them from following some of the genetic data is going extinct. We're down to single individuals. We know we're going to lose them anyway. So we're willing to work with this person who has indicated very clearly that they're in this for the long haul and want to put an easement over their property eventually anyway. So we're going to get a lot of benefit and we all have to do a little bit of give and take. What else are we working on? Well, of course, we're wanting to do invasive eradication. And there's a lot of really neat things that are being done here that involve research. So here we have a velocity barrier that has been inserted into a stream. And what happens is you increase the flow over this slick metal surface, and 
the invasive crayfish actually can't climb over that. So we created a barrier to prevent dispersal upstream. Unfortunately, in many cases, these barriers got in just too late. You know, maybe one year too late, the invasive got upstream. But we do have a few places, like this area in Sucker Springs Creek, where we do have an isolated population of Shasta crayfish left. We also have ongoing hand removals. So you get these buckets and buckets and buckets of the invasive. So they're doing this over and over again, year after year. The problem is that you have to get every last one out. All it takes is one pregnant female, and it's all over again. So we're working on some new approaches. What can we do? How do we get all of these invasive crayfish out of a wet stream bed where they can be up in the crevices? And what we're thinking about doing next is actually diverting this flow from the pinch point into a flexible cul culvert so that the water is no longer in the stream bed and it dries out the banks and it's going to draw the crayfish out. So then we can actually pick them up more easily. And then after that, we're going to actually say, okay, there still could be some left in the banks, and we're going to get search and rescue dogs who have been trained on the scent of crayfish. But we have these partners. The guy who's going to be donating the dogs is actually going to be donating the time for free. He's, he's interested in using scent dogs for conservation. So it's really about partnerships and then thinking creatively about how to solve the problems. We're also working very closely on coordinating among new stakeholders. One of the as we talked about before the State Department, one of the big challenges is finding a habitat that is completely isolated from where the invasives can get to. And one of the streams that the that Shasta used to be in before they were listed has now been completely diverted to feed into a hatchery. And the hatchery has its particular needs, and we're interested in diverting the stream back into the original bed and then going, sending the water back to the hatchery. But the hatchery has its own issues. They want to make sure they get good water delivery that's clean so that they can keep their hatchery stock healthy. And so we've been working with them to do a lot of different kinds of research. And in this case, what you see is a bladder dam that has been put across what was the dry stream bed. We sent in a small amount of flow, measured the flow going in and the flow going out so that we could try to provide assurances to the hatchery that it's not a losing reach, that they're going to get at least as much water as they would have before. And so through these sort of relationships where we slowly build and everybody gets to know each other, we can actually get a lot of it, a lot of stuff done. And this is actually one of the biggest recovery actions we could possibly accomplish for this species. This is a huge area of habitat, relatively speaking, that we could get reestablished with crayfish. And then again, I have to go back to the research that we've done to tell us which population to reintroduce them. So a, a few concluding thoughts. Um, we have a lot of species that we have to deal with. 103 that are offices, the lead four, over 250 that actually occur in our jurisdiction. And many of them are at really, really low numbers, but we can still get a lot done. It shouldn't be as discouraging as it sounds when you hear that there are only five left. Look at what happened with the Baker's Lodge, but we're on a great trajectory toward recovery at this point. So if we can find partners and people who are dedicated, we can actually get a lot of conservation done with a limited amount of funding. And so, of course, I do want to acknowledge these partners. We've had a lot of support from pg and Spring, Spring Rivers, my talk just went away. Um, <laughs> partners with Fish and Wildlife, private landowners, and a variety of other folks have been really, really important in getting these things done. Thank you very much. We have a questions. species that only occurs on a small area that's about 60 or 70 acres near Antioch. Remnant dunes ecosystem. The dunes were mined historically. There's not much dune left. We had population numbers up in the close to 2000-ish, around the year 2000. I think that's about right. 2400. 2400. Got an expert up front, so correct me when I get it wrong. Um, we saw an acceleration of the, of the numbers dropping from about 2000 onward. And it has a lot to do with invasives and I think at this point we're also facing a couple of things, maybe some predator issues, and also really looking at the late effects. I mean, tiny population of individuals. And if we have a flight that might only be 50 individuals in a year total, finding mates 
is there inbreeding going on? I think there has been some suggestion looking at emergence times changing and wing size that there might be some sort of genetic effects happening. So I think it's a combination of factors. And the approach we're taking at this point is habitat restoration to removal of non-natives, captive propagation, and trying to bring sand back to rebuild the dig system. How many species, according to your rubric, which is your describing at the beginning, how many species are high threat and low potential versus low threat and high potential? I don't have a breakdown, so I, when I look, look at our rankings, it seems like there's a fair spread across, and those are somewhere in the government priority number of 3 to 12 kind of group, which kind of bunched in the middle. Sorry, I'm going to use all that. Okay, so the Baker's large bird, that's a great, that's a great story. And I just think that it seems like this is an example where sort of like community-based research and involvement could be something, I think that would be pretty much underutilized. I mean, because some of the stuff that I'm interested in in terms of adaptive traits, quantitative genetic stuff, is not rocket science, that's why I do it. And it's, it, but it's not that hard to understand, so you're supposed to get involved with this kind of stuff. And you can have them monitoring other sites, so they could be giving you data in terms of adaptive stuff. So I think it's really underutilized and a really great approach. I agree, and we would love to use it more, but looking at our entire workload in our office, it really does take that person from the outside saying, look at this, you can do this right now. So we're always looking for new partners who are willing to just take something and run and help, you know, mostly want to just stay out of the way while they get it done. Yeah. But, but <laughs> letting them know that they can do it. Yeah, they can do absolutely. They can do science, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So for all of the um, invasive crawfish that you remove, what are you doing with them? They get killed. They're done. They're not edible? Um, they're pretty small, and as far as I know, Maria doesn't actually do much with them. Yeah, yeah, they've been talking about how the barbecue's back from the other day. What's happening in the Manzanita plant and what are the ideas for recovery or uh, the future of that? Before the uh, Manzanita was pulled, we wanted to do as much as we could to ensure that if it died during the transplant, we would still have something left. So we collected seed from the base around where it was. We took several hundred, I can't remember exactly the number of cuttings, and make sure they were actually showing roots before we picked it up and pulled it out of the ground. And so at this point, we have a bunch that are in cultivation and ready to be out planted. Mm -hmm. We are monitoring it. We're trying to actually deal with the listing because the listing is moving forward. Now that we know it's there, we've received a petition, we're going through that process. So a variety of different things. But I think the biggest hope is that these cuttings will allow us to establish new populations. So this is self property kind of setting the well, Everything is closed. We're talking about cuttings. We haven't actually gotten any seed germination yet. Oh, we haven't. No, okay. So, well, that's, that's a whole other. So, we have one genetic type, really. There's no sexual reproduction. Not at this point. But, but you have a population of meristems that could undergo somatic mutation. So, you could be generating genetic variation out of that. Yeah, and there are some, I think, and I can't remember if the genetic testing has been done. There were some manzanitas that were in. Botanic gardens that might be impressed to me. I don't know. Holly, do you guys have one? Yes, there are, there are at least six suggested individuals that are possibly genetically distinct. But um, some park, the Park Service, uh, Michael Chasse, is working on his master's and he's doing initiating some of the genetic work so we'll know actually that they are distinct. That it's a little bit tough with Manzanitas, they're not that easy to do. So we might have the possibility of doing some crosses later on. 